All right. Well, it is good to be here. And uh, again, as I mentioned this morning, the Lord has moved and opened doors, and we're thankful that um, He's looks like created the opportunity for us to be able to stay here. Um, you know, we we still have some things that we need to deal with and work on in that regards, but you know. The Lord, I think, has really shown his hand because it wasn't that many weeks ago um, that it looked like we weren't going to be able to be here and we didn't really have enough time to find another place. Uh, and so it was looking like we were not going to be able to meet for a little while or we'd just go back to independence while we tried to find a new place. Um, and all of those obstacles kind of just fell away and um, we're able to stay here. Uh, we've got... Um, the, the rent is going up, but not as much as it looked like it might originally. Uh, and so that's a good thing. And, and, and it's just a blessing to see the Lord move. Our desire, right, we wanted to stay here, but our prayer was that the Lord's will would be revealed, that the Lord would show us what he wanted done. And uh, I believe that um, the Lord has definitely shown his hand and he has shown some things um, how he can move when it looks like we, we don't think that's going to be an option. And so we're thankful for that. It's, it's good to see the Lord move and uh, just continue to pray for us as we try to work out all the details. Um, but it looks like we will be able to sign if we want to. Uh, we need to make that decision. We can. We have the option now of signing a two-year lease. So not only did the rate not go up as much as it looked like it was going to, we're not going to have to move, and also um, we can do a two-year lease, whereas looking like they were going to push for a three to five. So uh, I think, again, the, Lord is, uh, the Lord's working, and we're thankful for that. All right, so I told you this morning that I kind of had, um, <laughs> we, we had a couple different rabbits we were going to chase, and um, I just, as we looked at these passages in John chapter 14, the, the one that we covered this morning was the idea of love. And we wanted to talk about how in John 13, 14, and 15, we see this reoccurring theme that the Lord's command to them is that they love, but not just love, but they love like he loved them. And so this morning we talked about the fact that uh, the husband's love for the wife is supposed to, again, be like Jesus' love for his church. And we also talked about the fact that we are commanded to love our neighbors. Uh, all of the law is wrapped up in love God and love your neighbor. And then we ended with this idea of loving our enemies. Now, uh, this afternoon's message is totally different. This afternoon's message takes a different path. Um, not quite ready to jump back into John chapter 14 just yet. But the other thing that has been on my mind as we look at some of this is this concept of prayer. And I don't know how far uh, we'll take this. Um, I don't want to get too far away from the book of John just yet. But um, I, I think this is a topic that we probably need to do some study on. And so um, this afternoon, we're going to just talk a little bit about prayer. And what a better place to start than to use the Lord's example of prayer. And I don't just mean the model prayer that we talk about, but I really want to delve into, let's take a look at some of the places in the Bible where it shows us Jesus praying. Now, we're going to get into one of them, and this is why, to some degree, um, this is not off topic from John chapter uh, well, maybe not John chapter 14, but soon, John chapter 17, we'll circle back to this topic because that whole chapter of John chapter 17 is the prayer of Jesus, okay? Consider this an early introduction leading up to John chapter 17. Um, and again, depending on how the Lord moves over the next few weeks, um, we might spend some time in finishing up 14 and getting into 15, but also working on some prayer pieces as well. So uh, just pray for me. Uh, the Lord would show me uh, what he once talked about. But let's talk about Jesus' prayer life today. Now, as Christians, we're supposed to be Christ-like. 
but how often do we actually think about Christ's example of prayer in the Bible? How often, even though we call ourselves Christians and we think about the fact that we have this new nature and we think about Christ being our example, how many times do we actually sit down and go, okay, how did Christ handle this situation? How did Christ do this? You know, prayer is a really good example of this because many times we've taught on prayer. We might have even talked to our children about it. We might have even kind of sat down with them and tried to give them examples. And we hope they listen to us when we pray and they kind of learn how to pray, right? But how many times have we sat down and actually talked about Jesus and some of the things that he did when he prayed? We have a model prayer that he's given us, and we will cover that because that is part of Christ's teachings about prayer. But there are also multiple times in the Bible where the Bible actually recounts for us that Jesus himself went and prayed. And so we will just want to draw some conclusions from some of those. One thing I want to talk about first is that Jesus, for example, went off alone many times to pray. He very rarely prayed for his own wants. He very clearly, his prayers represented the fact that he wanted the will of the Father above all else. And he prayed for his people. Those are some of the things that jump out at you. And I realize I'm telling you some of the answers before we even cover it. But, but that's important for you to know that those are, as you look at these passages, notice those themes. He often goes off alone. For prayer time his prayers are not self-centered his prayers are very much about other people um, now there are times when he does pray things about the things that he's involved in so don't don't think it's wrong to pray for the situation you're involved in I'm not saying that but despite everything going on around him the Lord's desire in his prayers was that the will of the Father be done. That is a theme that you see throughout Jesus' teachings. Okay? And so we want to talk about a few of those. Let's talk first about alone time for prayer. Let's look in the book of Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to hit a lot of scriptures. And I know I haven't been doing this a lot lately, kids, so... Lots of times we're going we're gonna to pick a, a book and a chapter and we're going to focus, right? Well, today we're gonna, we are going to bounce around a little bit because I want you to understand, again, this pattern that you see in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when evening was come, he was there alone. Now, you have to understand, this is, of course, taking place. If you back up a few verses, it says, And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. So does this story sound familiar? One of the times of the feeding of the, of the multitude, right? He's just done this great miracle. He's taught these people. He has sent his disciples away in a ship. And what does he do? He goes off alone into a mountain apart to pray. Now you are talking about a man who is surrounded by people constantly. right? He has these followers that travel with him and when he goes places, people notice. And there's multitudes that he's, he's healing people, he's teaching people. Uh, we know that from some of these passages that uh, people wanted to make him king because of some of the things that he could do. But he intentionally goes off and finds time alone. Now, that took effort on his part, okay? Not easy to do. He had just fed 5,000 plus people, and they wanted to be around him. But he put forth the effort, and he made it possible for himself to be able to go off alone. And it isn't just that he needed some alone time. Lord Jesus Christ didn't just need some me time. He intentionally was going off with the intent of praying. 
Now he is about to walk on the water and to do all this stuff in the middle of the storm. He's about to teach his people. There's just all these things that are about to happen. People want to make him king. He says, it's time for me to go find some quiet time and spend it in prayer with the Father. So Mark chapter 14, verse 23 is a really good example of that. Now, what is it, from a practical standpoint, what does it do? It reduces the number of distractions, right? You're not likely to get bothered. You're not likely to get pulled away. You're not likely to have your attention pulled off to something else. Going off alone to pray reduces the distractions that would keep you from having that conversation with the Lord. I think it also reminds us that prayer is a very personal thing between you and the Lord. We oftentimes, you know, many times the prayer that we think about are the public times we pray. Well, we pray when we start services, or we, we pray at the end of services, or we pray before our meals. We, we, we pray to start a meeting. We, you know, these very public prayers. And by the way, I think that there's actual, absolutely scriptural indication that it's not, <laughs> it's not wrong to pray publicly. Now, I think there is some indication that you need to be careful when you pray publicly. But there are absolutely some times where the Lord himself prayed in front of people. But I also think that sometimes because of those public things we think about with prayer, we miss the fact that the prayer that we have with the Lord God Almighty is a very personal thing. This is me communicating with the Father. So it reduces the number of distractions and it reminds us that prayer is a very personal thing between us and our Father. I think you could also look at examples like Mark chapter 14. Let's turn over there real quick. Mark chapter 14. We're going to read, verse, start in verse 32. And they came to a place where was named Gethsemane, and he said unto his disciples, Sit here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on the ground, and prayed, that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now, again, you start to look at some of this, and it almost seems like he's, left some of his disciples, taken a few with him, but even those few he took with him, he said, you stay here, I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to pray. You see again the importance that the Lord places on that quiet time of me being with the Lord, having that conversation, having that discussion with the Lord. And we know in this case, and we'll get into this later, Right now, we're not even t dealing with the topics of his prayers. We're just dealing with what he did and how he did it. This was a very serious thing. He was going to the Lord heavy-hearted, or he was going to the Father heavy-hearted and burdened and troubled. And he said, you guys stay here, and you watch, and you pray, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to pray. So you see those types of examples. You know, I also, we don't have time to read all of this, um, but in Luke, um, you're going to see some examples um, where the Lord kind of starts to deal with people. And, and, and one thing I want you to notice, and we'll get into this in the next point, is many times the Lord would go off alone to pray, and what you find mm -hmm is that there was something big about to happen, right? He was going off, and, and the next thing you know, he's choosing his apostles, or he's 
casting out this demon-possessed man. Or, you know, there, there's, again, there's a little bit of a theme sometimes when you look at the different situations where the Lord would, the Lord would go off alone to pray, and the next thing you know, there's some big thing that's happening, right? Again, I think it's just a good example for us to think through some of those things. The other thing I want you to notice, and this is the second point, is that Jesus' prayer life was sacrificial. And, and I think you'll understand that a little bit more here in a minute. But if you turn to Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, and again, I apologize, we're going to be doing some bouncing back and forth. Let's back up here a couple verses. Uh, Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 30. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. Now I read those verses for you to understand how busy he is at this point. Verse 33, and all the city was gathered together at the door. He had a city full of people that wanted to bring their problems to him for resolution. And he's healing people. But notice in verse 35, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. I want you to see again, point one and point two go together very much, right? He, we see in this yet another time where he goes off into a solitary place to pray. But what I want you to notice this time is how sacrificial it was. He was willing to get up bright and early, maybe bright's the wrong word, early enough that it was still not what would be considered morning time, and he went off alone to pray, right? And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out. I wish, again, I wish I could sit up here and tell you that I've got all of this figured out and that I live this perfect example of, of prayer life and how things should be done. Understand, I got a lot to work on. I am not your example. The Lord Jesus Christ is your example. If you pattern after me, your pattern is going to be just that much different from the original. You know, when I used to work with Brother Wayne and we'd do the woodworking stuff, you made a pattern and you used that pattern for every other cut you were going to make. You didn't cut the first one Use the first one for the pattern for the second one and then use the second one for the pattern for the third one and the third one for the fourth one. You always use the first one as your pattern for everything else. Now, it's not giving me an excuse to not be what I need to be. But understand, I am not your pattern. The Lord Jesus Christ is your pattern. That's who you should build your life around. And one thing that you see from him is that even if it meant the whole city was going to be at his door, when it came bedtime, he was willing to get up bright and early and go out to be alone so that he could pray. Now, you might would think that anybody else wouldn't, I mean, if anybody doesn't need a solid prayer life, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But you don't see that you see that he has a deep desire to have that conversation, to have that pattern of prayer with the Father. So not only is it good sometimes to get off alone, but remember that sometimes your prayer life might need to be sacrificial. You might also look in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. 
And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve. Now I mentioned that in passing a little bit ago, right? Well, notice that whenever the Lord went to call his twelve apostles, this is not whenever he first met them like we saw in John. This is not when they first became his disciples. This is when of his disciples he named twelve to be ambassadors. He named them as his apostles, gave them special things. What did he do the day before that? He went off alone in prayer to God, but not just five minutes, not even 15 minutes. It literally says in the last half of verse 12, and continued all night in prayer to God. Understand the pattern that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us is sometimes you're going to need to be alone. Sometimes you're going to need to have some sacrifice in your life in order to accomplish this communication with the Father. And when you've got big, huge impacts and decisions that are about to be made or that you're about to implement, it's not a bad thing to spend a significant amount of time in prayer to God now, we know the Lord Jesus Christ is divine. We know that he was not going to make a mistake with picking these 12 people. But he still went to God in prayer all night long. He is the pattern for our life. And continued all night in prayer to God. Now, it doesn't say that every time. Sometimes, like in John chapter 17, you get a feel for how long his prayer was. It pretty well gives you his prayer. In other places, it might just say that as he finished praying, his disciples had a question. It wasn't an all-night thing. It wasn't this big, long, huge thing. But there are times when we just need to get away and we need to spend some serious time with the Lord. So, alone time, sacrificial time. And the other thing we want to talk about is to what end were the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ? What was the purpose of the prayer of the Lord? Well, if you would, we'll turn back to Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Again, I think that as you look at this, uh, and we're just going to read this in passing. Um, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. It names out the disciples. Even in verse 16, in the Judas, the brother James, and Judas Iscariot, was who, which was also was the traitor. Now, I want you to understand something. We know from later on the Lord Jesus Christ knew that he was a traitor. But yet he still picked him. The Lord knew what he was doing. The Lord didn't go off and spend all night in prayer alone and then pick 12 and make one mistake. We know from what we read in John and some other places, he knew what he was doing when he picked Judas Iscariot, right? But I also want you to think about this as we look at some other places. I think what you're going to find is he teaches us to always put the will of the Father first. You can think about Luke chapter 22. Let's go back there, Luke chapter 22. Now we read part of this already, but let's read some more. Starting in verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. You see here the level of burden that the Lord had and this idea of him being troubled. And his 
even saying, Lord, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I want you to understand, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We wanted to stay here in this building. We feel like this is where the Lord has led us to be in this community. And when it looked like that wasn't going to pan out, you know what I didn't want to do? I didn't want to just come along and say, Lord, work it out so we can stay here. That's what I want, and I want you to give that to me. You know why? Because what I see in the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Our desire should be to see the will of the Father accomplished. That's what our desire should be, to see the will of God accomplished. Sometimes, I, I'm going to give you guys a hint, okay? Sometimes it's not going to be the way you want it to be. But if your desire is truly that the will of God be accomplished, then you'll be able to go to Him with your prayers and your petitions and your supplications and you will be willing to say at the end of that, Lord, this is what I desire, but if that's not what you want, I want to be okay with that. Now that is not to say, by the way, because you can take all the stuff to the extreme, that is not to say that you can't bring your petitions before the Lord. That's not to say that if you've got somebody in your family that's struggling with something, that you can't come and say, Lord, if you please, would you please heal this person? Would you please help this person? Would you encourage this person? Lord, would you do this? I'm not saying that you can't go to him and ask for those things. I think the scripture indicates that we absolutely can. But our heart's desire should be that the will of God be done because we don't always understand why things are happening. And I think it's important to understand that as you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, that that is absolutely what he prayed, was that the will of the Father be done. And I'm just giving you an example. But I, think, I don't think I have to go too much deeper on this one, because as we've went through the book of John, hopefully you've been listening. And what do you see time and time and time again? I'm just saying what the Lord wants me to say. I'm following the commands the Father has given me. I'm doing the will of the Father. I'm here to accomplish the will of the Father. I'm here to do the work that He sent me. What's the focus? The focus is that the will of God would be done. So let's talk about this. What did Jesus Christ teach about praying? I think if you look over to Luke chapter 11, verse 1, you could actually see what's often referred to as the model prayer. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now before we get into the main point, I want you to notice something. It is okay to teach people how to pray. What did John teach his disciples? He taught them how to pray. And the Lord's own disciples come to him and say, Lord, can you teach us how to pray? Now what triggered that question? Christ was living by example. Christ was praying and people noticed and they wanted to know how to pray. Now this is a fine line. Have you heard the concept or the principle of not doing things to be seen of men? I've struggled with the balance on this one. Because sometimes you can take something and say, well, you know, Elliot, I think that you should pray and I think you should witness to people and I think you should be out there and be zealous for God. But man, don't let anybody see you doing any of it. Because then you're just doing it to be seen of men. Well, first off, it's a little hard 
to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ and not have anybody see you doing it. Because hopefully, you're talking to somebody. I don't think that the Bible is necessarily declaring in those places that you can't do things that are seen of men. It says don't do them to be seen of men. But I also understand that sometimes we are told that we are supposed to live our life so that our children can see what needs to be done. Do you know, Sierra, sometimes your mom does things and she does them when you're around so that you can see how it's done. Joe, sometimes when your dad does things, part of why he's doing that so is so that you and Elliot and Caroline and Cece can see the role model, the way we're supposed to do it. Jesus Christ was praying. He, although often did go off alone, in this case he was praying in a place where at least people could see what he was doing. And people said, would you show us how we should pray? In verse 2, and when he had said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now as you look at this, they said, Lord, show us how to pray. And he gave them some talking points. I want you guys to understand, and especially you younger ones, I know the adults have heard this before, but you younger kids, you will come in contact with people that will recite these words as a prayer. That is not what the Lord Jesus Christ meant. The Lord Jesus Christ was not saying, look, when you ask me to teach you how to pray, I'm going to give you a pattern. It did not mean this is the only prayer you need to pray or you just quote these exact words and that's how you pray. That's not what he meant. It's like asking somebody how addition works. And they tell you, well, 2 plus 2 is 4. Well, that doesn't mean that every addition, that every answer to every addition question is 2 plus 2 is 4. The pattern, the concept is what he's teaching them. And, there's, and he keeps it short, I think, so that we can see the points and the distinctions. When he says, O Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. He's actually telling us a few things. He's saying, one, you need to recognize the honor, the majesty, and the glory of God Almighty. You're not just coming to some thing here. You need to recognize the majesty of the one that you're coming before. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You are to be lifted up. When we go to the Lord, our desire is that he be glorified and he be honored. But not only that, it's that same principle that we saw that the Lord Jesus Christ had with his prayer when he said, not my will but thine be done, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. So one, I think there's a recognition of who you're going to and there's a desire to see the will of him be accomplished. And then in verse 3, give us day by day our daily bread. You know, it is okay to go to the Lord with your petitions. It is okay to go to the Lord with the things that you have need of. Give us day by day our daily bread. Now, this I think is also interesting because it's teaching us it's okay to go to the Lord for the things that you need. But I think it's also teaching us that, you know, go to Him for the day-to-day -day needs that you have. I don't see in this an attitude of, Lord, give me a million dollars that I might have 
a, comf a life of comfort and ease and never need anything again. He says, give us our day, give us day by day our daily bread. But notice the other pattern. And forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone that is de indebted to us. You know what? Your prayer, your prayer should include a desire for the Lord to forgive you for the mistakes that you've made. You say, well, I've been forgiven. I've been redeemed. I'm saved. My sins have been washed away. Yep, I agree. If you're redeemed, your sins have been washed away. But you know what? You still live in this life. You still make mistakes. And you still need to ask the Lord to set you straight, forgive you. Lord, help me. <laughs> I don't want to fall into that one again. Lord, help me to be better. Help me to grow. Lord, help me to not do that. But then he also says, as we also forgive everyone that is debted, indebted to us, understand that there is a lesson within a lesson here. And we may get into this in a little bit, probably not today, but understand that the Lord Jesus Christ here is, uh, and he teaches on this in more detail a little bit later, we need to be willing to forgive others if we want the Lord to forgive us for the mistakes that we make. It's not all self-centered, guys. We need to have an attitude of forgiveness if we want the Lord to be merciful to us. But notice this also, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This idea of giving the Lord glory, recognizing who He is and the desire to see His name magnified, a desire to see the will of the Lord accomplished, taking your petitions and your needs to Him, asking the Lord for forgiveness for the mistakes that you make, and a desire to be delivered from the things that tempt you and get in your way of your service to Him. When the people ask, teach me how to pray, those were the bullet points that he gave them. Now, if we had time, we could get into the lesson that spurred from this example. But I think for today, we'll leave it there in this passage. But again, alone time... Right? We saw that. Sacrificial willingness. A desire to always see the will of the Father accomplished. And then he even gave us a pattern for how we can come before the Heavenly Father in prayer. Recognizing who you're praying to, honoring him, desire him to be magnified, desire his will to be accomplished and then bring to Him your needs. Your physical needs and your spiritual needs is really a couple ways you could look at that, right? Give us this day by day our daily bread. Well, that's a physical need. Forgive us of our sins and help us avoid temptation. Well, that's kind of a spiritual need. Bring to the Lord your physical and your spiritual needs. The other thing, and um, we'll probably have to say, I'll mention it in passing, and then we'll probably just go ahead and stop, and we may pick up in some of this uh, next week. But I want you to think about this, kids. Christ didn't just teach this. You know, sometimes, I hope, kids, if you come to me and ask me to show you how to do something, I hope I don't just show you the right way and then I don't actually do it. There's a phrase that we're used to called practice what you preach, right? Well, you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ didn't just preach it and not practice it. If you've looked at some of the things that he's done, he has told them 
Now, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't need forgiveness, okay? Nothing the Lord Jesus Christ ever did ever required him forgiveness. So, he didn't ever have to go to the Father and ask for forgiveness. But you know what he did do in his prayer to the Father? Forgive those that have wronged me. He tells us, you need, when you ask for forgiveness, you need to be willing to forgive those that have sinned against you. Well, you know, he practiced that. When he was taken to be hung on the cross, one of the things he prayed for was for forgiveness for those that were doing it. When the Lord prayed in Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, he says, O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, so what, did he, what is he doing? He's doing exactly what he told us to do in the model prayer where he's talking about you recognize the Father and who he is. In places like Matthew 26, 51 through 54, you can see the Father's will always comes first. It's very much about it. Even to the point where when they came to get him, He could have called legions of angels. And he tells his followers that. I could have called legions of angels. But you know what was the most important thing for him? That the will of, the, the will of God be accomplished. I say this because understand, the Lord Jesus Christ lived a prayer life. It was important to him. He showed us by example how important it was. He told us how we should do it. And he went off and lived it. Now later we're going to get into John chapter 17 and understand that's the Lord's prayer. There's some things that happen in John chapter 17. It's not meant to be the model for us. Because we're not God, we're not divine. And he prays some things that honestly... Only he can do. Right? That's his prayer to the Father. The one he gave here was the bullet points for us. But he lived an example of prayer. Now, just for time's sake, I think we're probably going to have to stop right there. But um, if we have time next week, we'll talk a little bit more about how he didn't just teach it, but he practiced it. And the other thing we'll talk about is some of the things that he prayed for, which is a pretty neat thing when you start to look at some of that. So um, I don't know how far this study on prayer is going to go. We may just have this one and one more and be done. Uh, I don't know, but um, I just thought it was a good time for us to step back a little bit, knowing that the Lord's Prayer is coming up in chapter 17, uh, and, and just for us to step back a little bit and think about prayer and how we should do it, and the example that the Lord Jesus Christ set for us. All right? Well, we're going to go ahead and be dismissed this afternoon. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we'll go ahead and have Brother Philip come up and lead us in a song as we, as we close out the services. All right, let's go ahead and stand as we sing.